Without a doubt, my next guest has to be considered a media heavyweight. He's created several companies over the last 25 years and has worked with elite groups like the Times Mirror Company, the Los Angeles Times, Black Entertainment Television, and C-SPAN, the nation's first public affairs network, where he was an on-air host, interviewing the likes of Al Gore, Jack Kemp, Bob Dole, and many other political luminaries. He joins us now as the newly appointed public information officer for the city of Inglewood. So, I'm pleased to welcome Edward C. Maddox to the Urban Roundtable. Ed, welcome. It's great to be here. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, before we start talking about this new position of yours, let's go back a ways. Now, you've worked for many companies, as I mentioned. The business of media is, a lot of people just don't know about the business of media. Tell us what you did for all of those wonderful companies. I did an awful lot of different things, but it really started when I was a member of the White House staff under Jimmy Carter. And when you're at the White House, you live in a bubble, and you live under the glare of the TV lights, and everything you do is magnified by the media. And I was recruited out of the White House by one of the largest media companies. Times Mirror was the fifth largest company in the country then. And uh, I got a chance to work with broadcast television stations, with newspapers, with cable television companies. And I learned that there are great similarities between all these different media companies because basically it is about connecting advertisers to consumers in various ways. And I wanted to learn the business and I was very fortunate to do that. And uh, I was recruited from there by my friend Bob Johnson to go join BET and that's another story. It sure is another story. As a matter of fact, how rich is that guy? Nobody knows how much he really has, but uh, I read uh, that he is, of course, our first African-American billionaire. But what nobody really knows is that his wife, who's now his ex-wife, is the second African-American billionaire in the what? United States. And I'll just give you some idea of the kind of money that can be made in the television right. business. That's amazing. That's amazing. Now, you were also president and director of the Urban America Television Network, the UATV. Talk about what UATV is and, and, and what it did. What it, it does, actually. UATV uh, is not well known in California. Uh, it has about, uh, or I should say it had, it's really just failed recently, mm. about uh, 75 broadcast affiliates around the country in smaller and mid-sized markets doing urban programming. I believe for many years, really going back to the BET days, mm. that urban programming, programming that's targeting African Americans and other urban dwellers, uh, Hispanics, uh, and even urbanized whites, as we refer to them, people who share the same taste and food and music and culture and news and politics uh, could be reached with a single television feed. And so we had a chance to experiment with that. It was an awful lot of fun. And, and, it, and, and it, didn't, it went under? It went under. It was publicly traded. We oh. were one of the few minority media companies to go public successfully. But uh, yes, it went under and it, was, it failed really because of the advertising challenges. It's the chicken and the egg. Right, You've got to get right. the advertisers to pay for all this stuff. And uh, you don't get the advertisers until you have the audience. So uh, it didn't make it. But I continue to believe very much in the concept of urban programming. Well, it certainly sounded uh, like, uh, I think, a brilliant idea. What, what was that again? Uh, urbanized? I, I, I'm going to have to use that one. The, the well, it's the, it's the urban concept, and if you watch what's happening with Fox and with a lot of the new programs that have come along in recent years, you understand that they're going after not just explicitly African Americans, but they're going after that inner city urban viewer. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think many others do, that you can reach them uh, through television. Uh, these urban folks, and particularly African Americans, watch more television than anybody else. They tend to buy the same products. They tend to enjoy the same forms of recreation and on and on. So uh, the idea is to use television to go after that urban market. Right, right. Uh, now, let's get around to the Inglewood appointment, which I think is wonderful. I saw it and I said, no, wait a minute. That, he's all over the place, and now he's coming to Inglewood to be the public information officer. What is that going to entail for you? Well, I'm learning every day. 
uh, the first thing it entails is me learning the story of Englewood, Englewood's history, learning about all the opportunities facing the city. I happen to believe that Englewood is well positioned to grow in many different ways. Um, there are new developments on the uh, drawing boards. There are wonderful people with great energy. But geographically, when you look at the city, you know, adjacent to the airport, just a few minutes from the beach, a few minutes from downtown Los Angeles, this is a prime piece of real estate. And you have this interesting demographic mix of people. Anything's possible in Englewood. So public information officer, is this a new position that they could No, be? no, Especially it's... Especially for you. No, I wish I could say that. There have been uh, people in the same position before. But basically, it's the person who coordinates with the outside media organizations and the city council and the mayor's office and the various things going on. This, the city's got wonderful stories to tell about what it's doing in terms of the environment, what it's doing in terms of uh, uh, health and safety. Um, there are lots of things happening in the city, and the media wants to know about them. I'm interested because what I learned at the White House and what I learned at these media companies is that when you know the game, you're able to get your story across. It's not always easy. You can't just put out a press release and expect uh, the media giants in Los Angeles, in this community, right. to pick up your story and be excited about it. You have to make it very easy for them to cover it, and you have to explain to them why these stories are important to them. I think Inglewood needs you right now, right about now, in that position, because uh, it is on the move. Uh, we are, of course, I've always, for the last five years, have been touting and planning for a performing arts center here in Inglewood, in, in the uh, redevelopment area down uh, in, on Prairie and, and, and by the Forum and Hollywood Park. So uh, we're going to need the sharpest person we know to be in that position that you're in. I think it's great. Uh, I, I remember, and I'm just going to go back for a second to uh, my favorite program, in, in, and I'm a politico, I really love it, uh, is C-SPAN. And uh, I remember watching you on C-SPAN and did really enjoying, well, I always enjoy the show. But you, you, you were just so relaxed and so, and, 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 and what's his name, Lamb? What's the Lamb? Brian Lamb. Brian Lamb. Uh, to me, was the coolest, and he was really. And there you came, a person of color, uh, 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 following and sitting in that chair, doing your thing. What was it like doing C-SPAN? It was so much fun. Not only was I the first person of color ever at C-SPAN, I was the first person of color ever to host a live nationwide call-in format television show. And that doesn't really say a whole lot by itself until you think about it. It's you. It's generally one guest right. and a telephone. You're free to ask any question that you want. Right. The phone rings. They don't screen the phone calls. You pick up the phone call that's live going out on the satellite that's to amazing. the whole world. In fact, we would get calls from other countries at times. And anything could happen, and anything did happen. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. C-SPAN is very, very important. Uh, but it also shows you what's possible with the new technologies. Now we've got computers and the internet to add to the formula. Right. But what's possible is that people in remote areas sometimes become very excited about things like agriculture mm -hmm. or space policy, or issues where you would never think they would have an interest. People are very interested when they have the information. Yeah, a wonderful concept and still going strong and will be going strong. And I understand Lamb, Brian Lamb is still around. He's still going strong. He's in incredible uh, shape. He's got a photographic memory. He remembers not only every guest, but he remembers just about every phone call he's ever taken. That's he's amazing. Yes. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I truly enjoy it. Now, back to, uh, back to Inglewood and, uh, and, and some bringing somebody like yourself that's got so much experience. Uh, were you ever in production in, in, uh, in any way? Well, yes. I actually, after I stepped down, I was the first executive vice president at BET. And when I stepped down in that capacity, 
I became a producer of a, uh, of a talk show with the Congressional Black Caucus, okay. which was a lot of fun. It was mm -hmm. called uh, For the Record with the Congressional Black Caucus, and each week we'd have a different guest. And it was very similar to C-SPAN, except we didn't have the telephones. Right, right. I'm sure but, I must uh, have seen that. I, yeah, I produced that, and I produced uh, a couple of other public affairs shows. I was never interested in the entertainment side of it, frankly. I was always interested. Well, why not, Ed? <laughs> <laughs> Just not my thing, oh, you know. Okay. I uh, I love news. I love information. I love what's going on in the world, and uh, and I think that television can be a tool that helps uh, help uh, helps us figure out the answers. Right. And so uh, those are the things I wanted to do. I did a talk show with a uh, with an African American psychiatrist, and it was called For the Record with uh, Dr. Loma Flowers. Mm. And that, uh, not, not for the record, it was, I'm sorry, it was called Dr. Flowers on Call. Oh. Yeah, and I co-produced that okay. show, and I hosted that show along with Dr. Flowers, and we took phone calls from across the country, but we talked about issues of concern to the black community. Right. Um, issues like skin color discrimination in the black community. Now, when's the last time you heard a talk? about something like that. That's the paper, paper bag test oh, all we, over again. We, and we told stories and people would call in from, uh, from wow. different cities and it was an awful lot of fun. Uh, now Ed, you were in Washington DC, um, I believe you were in Washington DC when the FCC went the other way on us as it relates to where you know, African Americans and other minorities stand in, the, um, in, in, in media. Uh, were you there then, and uh, w w what do you think about uh, the direction uh, that we've been taken in? I first went to Washington um, in the mid-1970s and was there off and on for a period of about 17 years, up until uh, I think 91 or so. So yes, I was there during many of those fights. And it's interesting if you go back a little bit. There used to be an organization that very few people especially very few younger people remember. I think it was called uh, BEST, uh, and it was, uh, I can't remember the acronym exactly, but it was something like Blacks uh, for, the, for Education and Soul and Television or something. But these guys recognized that cable television was coming, that there were gonna be new forms of television coming, and it was gonna be very important for African Americans and other minorities to get their foot in the door. And that was when I first became aware of the politics of the business debate about what types of policies would lead to what answers. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to say that whatever they're pushing is going to promote more diversified television. Deregulation. Deregulation. Yeah. Well, not when you really understand the economics of it. And bigger is not always better when it comes to uh, allowing those people who don't have access to the billions of dollars that it takes to gain access or licenses. Mm -hmm. Low power television licenses were approved in the 1980s and that opened a small door but once again the big boys were able to dominate that stuff. Big fish, fish eat little fish. Yes and so uh, there has been a, a struggle for many many years um, in Washington and really in wa uh, on Wall Street about what kinds of policies would lead to more access. The fact is that there are a lot of people in this country who don't want more access. They're quite happy with having more channels but that are controlled by more and more people. If you look at cable for example, right. it's interesting. You see all these new channels. Some of us have you know 200 right. or more channels. But you don't have 200 companies that are programming those right. channels. You have HBO 1, right. 2, 3, 4, <laughs> right. and ESPN 1, one two, 2, 3, yeah. Yeah. and it goes on and on. Same and time. so they're happy to have more channels uh, made available by splitting them or whatever they yeah. want to do with satellites. But until you make it possible for the little guy to get in there and compete, you really haven't changed anything, but you, you might have um, you know, Three's company playing simultaneously on nine different channels. Yeah. What does that change? And we thought when deregul, we were pushing for it. We thought it was the right thing to do. Yeah. Well, obviously, it didn't didn't work for us. Yeah. It didn't work for us. What is the 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 uh, the answer to this? 
Well, there is no single answer, but part of the answer certainly has to do with economics. We have to spend more time learning how to make use of the capital that we do have access to. We also have to understand new technology because the old paradigm for television, which is very, very expensive, um, is no longer the only way to play the game. Right. The internet has changed the ball game tremendously. Indeed. So now you can have 18-year-old kids with uh, a Macintosh computer and an inexpensive camera and a lot of creativity mm -hmm. who have the ability now to reach millions of people around the world. This was not possible even 10 years ago. So um, technology was a big part. Capital is a big part. We will always need uh, money to do the important productions. But you can do, uh, you know, YouTube has taught us a lot well, about They're using cameras, <laughs> yeah, you know, YouTube, well, not YouTube, CNN. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I was talking with Matthew uh, a little while ago about how CNN, I mean, you know, the kids, people, not kids, but people are using their telephones and sending, sending uh, pictures back to the newsrooms. It's amazing. Well, it is amazing. And I've been to places like uh, South Africa and I've actually seen portable television sets uh, with portable satellite dishes taken to rural areas where people could download programming off a satellite, tape record it on some kind of a device, yeah. and show it to villagers who'd never seen television before. That's amazing. In fact, I was there when they were teaching people how to vote for the first democratic election in South Africa and watching the whole process and watching, watching technology come uh, and impact lives in, uh, in a dramatic fashion was something I'll never forget. That's amazing. Well, one day, hopefully, we'll get the, uh, get the FCC and all those guys on the right track where we can really kind of try to level the playing field. I know your involvement over the years in, in the media, and you also were involved in, you were involved in, weren't you involved at one point in, in finance, bank financing? Bank yes, financing? I was an investment banker for investment a while. Um, I was... I was not the kind that you read about with the movies and so forth who's doing billion dollar deals. Right. I was doing municipal finance oh, for okay. cities and counties and states. And it was, it was pretty interesting, but it was also pretty cutthroat. And it's really not my personality, but I did learn a lot about the game. And we all need to learn more about finance. Yeah, and if, even if we have to put on a gorilla suit to do it, we have to learn more about that. And Teflon underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Ed, you, you worked at BET for, for a good while, and uh, I recall uh, a lot of criticism of the network uh, for many reasons. Um, they weren't doing the right kind of programming. Um, well, were you there, when, were you there to, to get some of that criticism, or can you explain to our viewers what the situation was with BET and why it was so unpopular at one point that way? BET launched in 1980. I joined BET in 1983. I was the first executive vice president and I worked on marketing, I worked on program acquisition, I worked on, uh, I would go up to Capitol Hill and testify on behalf of the network. And I know the debate very well and it's very interesting. One of the things that's interesting is if you look at the programming of BET in its earliest years, in some cases, you will find a remarkably different product from the product that we've seen in recent years. BET had uh, black classic films. Lots of old films, many of those that you probably own and still watch and enjoy with, exactly. you know, that Oscar Michaud and many of the greats made. Um, but we also had programs uh, for children. Uh, Nipsey Russell used to do a children's show. I remember. Juvenile Jury. Yeah. Wonderful yeah. show. Got taken off the air. Um, BT had uh, health and exercise shows. Um, there was a woman, I can't remember her name, who did a wonderful exercise show way ahead of her time. If you took that show from 1983 and you transported it to today, it would work. It would work. Right. Uh, there were many things like that. But here was the challenge. Uh, and I would go into Bob's office and we would fight like dogs and cats about the programming. Bob did not watch television very much, first of all, and so he didn't really uh, think that it was as important as we all know that it is. Right. But the real question was, 
for a businessman like Bob, you know, how do you make money? Right. Doing the things that many of us think need to be done. And I thought, and I still believe, that BET could have been a family-oriented network doing substantive original programming profitably uh, at the same time that they were uh, recycling some of the older shows and movies that were important then and still have a strong appeal. Um, I lost that debate, and I'll tell you the day, or maybe not the day, but the week that I lost it. I can't remember the year, I think it was 1985. A guy named Michael Jackson came out with a music video called Billie Jean. Mm -hmm. Guess what? MTV refused to air it. What? Michael Jackson in 1985 was too black and too strong for MTV. Get out. The week that they refused to air his show, this became a headline story. People were very upset. They'd spent, you know, millions of dollars making this sure. at the time. It was probably the finest music video that had ever been produced. Great video. But they were into white rock. Bob, being this very shrewd businessman that he is, picks up the phone and he calls, I think it was CBS Records, and said, we'll run it. <laughs> well, we were doing music videos. We had a small music video show. It only had uh, uh, a few music videos. And uh, when this happened, Bob saw the opportunity. And it also coincided with a cable show that Bob and I went to where we would show our programming for the coming season. Right. Usually we'd have one little monitor and we'd have, you know, 20 square feet of space. Right. And we were a small, you know, item that most of the cable operators would ignore if they could. Yeah. This year we brought a few extra monitors and we brought that music video. In fact, it was the only thing we basically showed. That's all you needed. And we'd put a sign up and say, next showing of Billie Jean in 30 minutes. Wow. And they, just, they came, I mean, we're talking about white cable operators from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and all over the country. And they were like little kids. They were transfixed. Sure. And then the word got out. They said, you mean MTV won't run this? <laughs> and we ran it to death. And that was really the point, in my belief, mm -hmm. that Bob and the company recognized the true power, the economic power, and bottom the marketing line, power. Bottom line, and Bob. Guess, and guess what? the music videos were free to the company. You're getting free programming, you're selling advertising on it, and what's the next thing that happens? You're a billionaire. That's why it started then. So, you know, I, you know, I, I still believe that he may not have made quite as much money, but I think the company would have made an important contribution uh, by branching out and doing those things that, uh, that need to be done. But, I'll tell you what, from a business standpoint, a pure dollars and cents standpoint, it's hard to argue with, the, with a strategy that became 70% music videos. Wow. Now, what happened, uh, what happened and why did he sell the company? Well, um, he sold the company for $3 billion. Oh, that's why he sold the company. Okay, he started it for uh, under $500,000, most of which he borrowed, okay? So if you look at those numbers and somebody says, here's three billion bucks, uh, it's very hard to turn it down. I think it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> well, not only that, he's taken the money that he got and he started other companies and now he owns hotels and he's doing all kinds of other things. Sports franchises. Yeah, yeah no, he's, he's sharp. And you know, I met this guy, he was an AA for Walter Fontroy. I remember, yeah. that's when I met him, yes. It was, it was amazing. And we were tennis was, partners. Yeah. Really? And then all of a sudden I read, you know, Bob, I said, is that the Bob Johnson I know? Yeah. Is that AA for Walter? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you were asking before about the times and what was going on in Washington. Well, what was happening in the late 70s was that um, uh, the cable industry was getting off the ground. Mm -hmm. And so Bob had left Walter Fontroy's office and gone to work for the Cable Trade Association where a proposal for a 24-hour children's network was going by. A proposal for a 24-hour news network was going by. All these proposals were going by Bob's desk. And Bob said, you know what? If you painted these black, you know, all the things that you say about those viewers who want to see a particular type of programming are certainly true for black America. 
And he took that idea to John Malone and the rest is history. Wow, and borrowed a half a million dollars and made three billion. Ain't nothing wrong with that, my friend. Nothing that's wrong. amazing. I would love uh, to be able to share some of those. That's, that's enlightening. I didn't realize that's how it really started uh, with the Michael Jackson video. That's a classic story. I've, never, I've read many bios of Bob and uh -huh. BET. That's a story I've never seen in print anywhere. The urban so it's exclusive here the to urban you. The Roundtable <laughs> gets the exclusive. Okay. Well, now, we, we, the story of BET is a classic story. Now, there are a lot of other black entrepreneurs out there probably wanting to parlay whatever they're doing into something like that. What, are you, what, what is your advice for, for those young entrepreneurs with the possibilities? I have watched many of them crash and burn over the years. Some famous names, um, and I probably shouldn't mention them now, but there are some nationally known business people uh, who have been successful in magazines uh, and in real estate and other functions who've attempted to launch a black network. And they said, if Bob can do it, so can I. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very much about timing. It's very much about partnership. And at the end of the day, like with most uh, businesses, it's very much about economics. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have those things under control, you're destined for failure. Uh, but the timing was very, very important. There was room for one network. Right. There wasn't really room for two or three in the early 1980s. Uh, Bob just happened to be first in line to get there. Right on his heels, there was an effort called the Apollo Network that you might, might remember. Percy. From New York, right. Percy Sutton. Right. I mean, they were literally months behind BET in trying to launch. They had a more glamorous... Uh, programming profile, more big names. They had the Suttons, they had New York, but you know what? They were second and the market was just cracking the door open and there was room for one mm. and not two. Things have changed now. There's room for a little bit more, but timing is always a, a critical issue. This is one of the things I learned when I was at Times Mirror and watching white companies and those that succeeded and those that failed. These are rules of success regardless of race and color. Right. Uh, for black networks though, m many people who want them really should be going into the real estate business or something else <laughs> because not everybody's going to succeed. It's right. not, not a, a simple thing. But what I would tell young people is look at technology. You know, I love talking to young people about technology because now you don't need a 500 million dollar studio operation and trucks and a huge staff. If you've got 10 friends mm -hmm. and a couple of cameras and some creativity, right. you can go out and you can create something and you know what? YouTube, you know, there are a lot of places where you can test your idea and you just might make it. My son, Robert Jr., my youngest son, Robert Jr., who's a filmmaker, youngest, he's 30, uh, but he is the youngest he's a filmmaker, and he is doing just that. He got eight of his friends, and he, he wrote a, a, a complete screenplay, but he's only doing like a 10-minute version of it, uh, shooting it, you know, with all this new technology. Got a couple of very interesting friends with names, Tommy Davidson, the comedian, yeah. and he, it's going on YouTube, and he is about, I think, to make a deal to get the whole thing done. So exactly what you're saying is happening. Now, 10 years from now, YouTube will be the old paradigm. Exactly. Be but it's paradigm. happening now and people should make use of it. The other thing I would say to people who want to be like your son and other folks, both your sons who are extraordinarily successful, yeah. is look outside the United States. I go to Africa a lot. I go to the Caribbean. These are places that are screaming for our creativity, our know-how, and for television. There are places that have, not only do not have cable, they don't have broadcast signals yet. And so you have to um, go to these places and bring your know-how and be prepared to be a little patient. You're not gonna be a Bob Johnson billionaire right. you know, overnight, but you might get your, your feet on the ground and you might be able to get something going. And also, Ed, there's funding in those places They've as well. Money. Yeah. That's right. Especially Africa. I mean, I mean, other countries as well. Yes. But I mean, I've 
fielded uh, deals and uh, you know agreements uh, that didn't work out, but the money was there. So yes. the funding is, is, is in most countries. Offshore stuff. Yeah. Well now, thank you so much, my friend, Mr. Maddox, for coming in. I wish you all the luck in the world with your new position here in Inglewood and look forward to seeing you more. Uh, not necessarily here, you know, if you want to come back, you're always welcome to come back. But I'm in Inglewood a lot. I'm kind of an adopted son of Inglewood because of this wonderful performing arts center that Milton R.F. Brown and I and Judy and a lot of other people are, are involved with, uh, with. So I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much for coming and gracing us with your presence. Well, I congratulate you for this program. You and Milton are doing a wonderful job here. And anything I can ever do to help, just call, just whistle. Thanks a lot, Ed.